Katie, have we had more people sign up for lightning talks or wild ideas? This is Gail. Um, I am not sure. I don't think so, but I can also verify with Avery. I only okay. saw Bill Sheehan sign up for a wild idea, but I don't know if he actually went in and filled it out or not, or if he's going to join us. Bill, are you here? Or, yeah, so I have no idea. This is done. Sorry. So this is an open session, open posters. We can share screens. For those of you who are here with your poster, we can have chats. Um, so we are here for you and here to enjoy Posters Plus and a way to be more social around the poster session uh, than maybe even we can do in person because it's all of us together. <laughs> So would it be useful to y'all? Um, is there somebody who'd like to go first or like to start the conversation? Or would you like a tour of the Posters Plus if I shared my screen or something like that? Would that be useful? And don't all speak at once, please. <laughs> I think a tour would be nice. Thanks, Peter. Because yeah. again, yeah. we're navigating this territory for the first time. So your input and how you want us to go is uh, is important, so we want to hear from you. Let me try, see if I have permissions yet. Oh yes, okay. All right, so here we are. Let me close things. I didn't got too many things open. We'll see how that works out. Um, and I can make it bigger. So just quickly here, I'll try to scroll not too fast. We have about 17 entries here, I think, for posters. Some have videos. Bill reached out, um, but we don't, I don't know if he's had a chance to fill that out yet, exactly what his wild idea is. So is there someone here who'd like to tell us about your work? And we can go there. Any brave firsties? No brave firsties. Katja, are you here? Oh, wait, somebody's speaking up. Who's that? It was me. Who is me? This is Peter. Hi. Hi, Peter. Oh, good. Yay. Why don't you share your screen then, or would you just want me to click through on yours? Uh, no, I'll share my screen. Good. So let me stop sharing. And. Uh. I think it might take Avery or Katie a second to bump you up to, I'm not sure how they've done the permissions. There you go. Hi. I'll... So nice. this is the PDF of my poster. Can everybody see it? Yes. Yep. All right. So uh, my poster is called Estimating the Completeness of Preserved Collections and Representing Global Biodiversity. And it is about a very simple question, really. Uh, how many species are in my collection? How many species are in your collection? Can we compare them? And can we estimate how complete we are for a genus, a family, or whatever other uh, different grouping you wish to make? Now, this, this sounds pretty easy, or at least it sounds pretty easy to the people I've told it about who are not in the field. <laughs> But it's actually uh, rather complicated because, of course, as we've noticed from the previous uh, talk, talks, uh, we don't all speak the same taxonomy. Uh, our collections are not completely inventoried or not completely digitized. And even if they are, not everything in our collection management systems makes it to GBIF, which I'm using as a reference here, by the way. And uh, even if we take that into account, uh, the way specimen make it to GPIF is uh, incomplete, it is random, and it's not homogeneous. So we can use a system called rarefraction to, to compensate for this. 
And I have been uh, lucky enough to be able to use some of GBIF's resources via Microsoft Planetary Computer and Azure uh, Databricks. Thank you, Tim, uh, to, to help answer some of these questions, at least for Mesa. So what we were wondering was, <clears throat> can we estimate how many species of plants we hold in Mesa Botanic Garden? How complete are we for Africa as a continent? And if we pick some completely random and not, not totally not selected because we are interested in them families, how complete are we for those? And if we compare that whole story to GPIF, where do we stand? So uh, I'll start zooming in so this becomes a bit more dy uh, dynamic. Uh, I'll start in the middle. What about the middle? So it turns out uh, Mesa Botanic Garden, formerly the, the, the National Botanical uh, Herbarium, the National Botanical Garden for Belgium and the biggest herbarium, is very complete for Central Africa, especially for uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is of course a former colony. So, uh, by the way, how long should I be should I be talking? Because I can probably talk for quite a while. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, what's 17 posters divided by two hours, y'all? Somebody do the math. Should I be speeding up, Deb? I don't know. Um, it also is going to depend on how many other people. How about put a plus one if you'd like to present your poster? I'm not even sure who else is here. Uh, how about that? If y'all are here who want to uh, share your poster this way, put a plus one in the chat so we can count. Ah, Thank you. Thank you, David. I knew somebody would do the math for me. All right, I'll, do, I'll just keep talking and we'll see where we stand at yeah, the end. Yeah, keep going. I'm counting as yeah. people. <laughs> very well. So we are, we are very complete for uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. 87% of all plant species in GBIF uh, that, that GBIF knows about anyway, uh, we hold in our herbarium. Uh, and that's without extrapolation. So uh, our African herbarium is pretty completely digitized, but not completely, completely digitized. So that means that it might even rise. Uh, then looking at uh, this graph over here, it shows that we hold about half of the, can you see my mouse? I assume you can, that we hold about half of the plant species for the whole of Africa. And if we start extrapolating, so if we start incorporating the, the taxon that haven't made it to GBIF yet, both for us and for uh, the whole uh, world, we see that uh, the number of uh, plant species in uh, the world for Africa rises above 80,000, which is above the, the current estimates. Uh, and we see that the, the still holds true that we hold around half of everything. Uh, some a nice observation here is that if you look up what the expected amount of plants in Africa is, it's around 75,000 to 80,000. So it looks like my extrapolation <laughs> lands right in the middle, which is, is quite satisfying to me because that was not one of my uh, research questions, but I proved that I, uh, I found it out anyway. And if we start looking at, uh, at, fam at families, um, this is a, a fungi, this is palm trees, this is the coffee family, and this is uh, a family uh, a Quentin pointed me too, but apparently it's also something we uh, specialize in. You can see big differences. So for example, here, the Conoraceae, uh, we are incomplete for it, but we do hold a large proportion. GBIF is rather complete, but not complete. Looking at Rubiaceae, we are uh, incomplete, but flattening. Looking at Ariaceae, which is another specialized family for us, uh, we are incomplete, but, and we will never hold a large proportion of all taxa that are known for the world. Uh, what is this all useful for? You can use this sort of insight on a family by family level to direct your uh, uh, collection policy and your digitization policy. And I want to point out that, that the, the sort of uh, comparison you need to do to just put your whole uh, collection management system or whole database next to the whole of GBIF is a really non-trivial uh, database operation. And I I'm only able to do this because I had access to uh, Spark and to uh, the uh, Azure Databricks cl uh, cluster. Well, the Spark cluster that was hosted on Azure Databricks. Uh, I noticed that things are going on in, uh, in yep. chat. Two, do you happen to know the costs of running a GBIF snapshot in Databricks? Uh, I think Tim would know. Uh, 
I don't think it's very expensive. I think it's quite reasonable. Uh, for reference, I also did part of the stuff in the Europe uh, European instance of uh, Galaxy. Less than we thought. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Joe. <laughs> well, I don't have them, yet. I don't have the numbers. Uh, but you could do it on there for free. And I know you can run Spark on Galaxy, uh, but it's a bit more complicated to set up. And I wanted something that was more easy to replicate. So when the opportunity arose to use uh, to do the compute where the data already was, that's what I did. Um, um, hmm? Go ahead. I have a side question or a side point to everyone while we're doing this. If you are not a poster presenter, but you're here to view the posters, each one of those poster entries inside Whova, you can click on and talk directly to the author of that poster and ask them questions. So, and, and it's permanent. You can come back in and look later in case they are not here and then they can answer. Um, but I just want you to realize it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. No, no, no worries. Uh, fun fact, uh, I just did a the quick calculation a few days earlier. If you were to print the the table I ended up with to make the graphs on the on the left and on the right, if you were to print that out on A4 paper and you were to use Windows Notepad, and uh, you would use standard copy paper, the the pile of paper you would end up would be five meters high, and if you would put that end to end, that would be around uh, eight miles long. So this is really a non not. We, we, this this poster is beyond the the past, beyond the point of what you could do manually, <laughs> and uh, that's why I think this really opens opportunities uh, to do this sort of stuff using Spark and using bringing the compute to the data. Uh, in this case, GBIF, but you could uh, you could do this on other databases as well. Questions? Anybody? Feel free. I have one if nobody else does. So waiting for y'all to go first. And I was also funded by Disco Flanders. Uh, now I still have the opportunity to uh, do my tank work. So I'd like to thank uh, GBIF, Disco Flanders, Galaxy, and uh, of course, everybody who el else who helped on this paper. It's uh, over 350 institutes providing data. The, the list is a bit long. <laughs> so Peter, for, for this, and you're comparing uh, species to species, mm -hmm. what about uh, other variables that we could compare like collectors? So that you could understand the scope of the collectors you have compared to the collectors that another museum has and look for things like overlap or absolutely, absolutely. You could definitely do that. Uh, the reason I went for this question, or that we went for this question, because I'm not the only author, uh, is because we wanted uh, a really simple question to answer that we could do some more fancy statistics on. Because the calculation of our refraction curves, uh, that's it's like bootstrapping, the, and it is it includes bootstrapping. That uh, the higher your input table, the, the bigger your input table, the longer it will take. So uh, we were really hunting for something that was a bit more complicated than a simple table join or like a fuzzy string matching, which we can parallelize really easily, uh, but not so complicated that I couldn't finish it before that week. <laughs> Good point. I, I did yeah. want to share, and, I, and Dave, I don't think David's here. I just looked through the pictures quickly. Correct me if I'm wrong, David. Shorthouse, are you here? I don't think he. Um, what I would say is recent stuff that we did with a um, NSF grant under the rapid thing for COVID, um, looking at bat researchers. We And when we published the paper, y'all will see a graph. But we were able to basically with the work we did to disambiguate people, create a graph that would quickly show you at the collections level, what other collections in that particular network we assessed have a lot of things from that same collector or conversely, you have something, uh, information collected by an individual that other people in the network don't have at all. 
So this is another way in which you could um, capitalize on somebody else has already done the digitization or the georeferencing or has more information about that person. But on the other side, it also has the opportunity to show you your collections where they are unique, um, which also, of course, has value. Um, so thanks for sharing that with us. And thanks for going first. <laughs> other oh, I, I don't questions? mind. Mm, thanks, Peter, very much. Other ideas before we move on for Peter? So I encourage everybody to get in there and leave comments or questions too in the, where the poster is so that other people who go and visit it can um, appreciate that, the conversation. Um, let's see, who put their hand up? It's, it, you guys have at least 10 minutes each with the way we've divided this up, I'd say. Um, who volunteered to go next? I'm going, I'm scrolling back up in the chat here. Um, Mike, was it you? Oh no, I think it was Mike. Drizna. Mike put his hand up first. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat and I, I only Ma see. Yeah, Mike um, did and then Abby and then Katja. So I don't yeah, see Mike. I'll put okay. in the Zoom chat. I think that's, yep. we've got that's two chats. That's the difference. About. Yep, yep, yep. I'm, I'm looking at them both. Um, so go Mike. All right, so. Um, I'm going to start on the, the caveat that I, I didn't realize that I was going to be presenting in, in this way necessarily. So I'm going to kind of ad lib uh, talk about my uh, poster. Um, so let's see. I'll share my little um, posters plus um, page here. Um, so the posters here, and I just wanted to point out that um, as, as Deb mentioned, there's a little chat interface here. So um, feel free to send any questions in this in this chat box here, um, especially if they're things that I would help if I could uh, uh, look them up later and uh, answer you in line. So um, here is the poster itself. I've got it in another tab here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking today about uh, a project called Pi Open Sci. Um, a lot of you probably have heard of a project called R OpenSci. Um, that project has been around for several years now and is uh, pretty well established um, and is built around, that project is built around uh, writing R packages for open science projects. Um, a, a lot of them have to do with um, accessing um, specific APIs. Um, in biodiversity um, APIs, as we've talked a lot about uh, in, in other sessions today and in other days, um, as, as well as in other um, science domains. Um, I uh, am really jealous of that, that project. I uh, tend to use Python a lot more often in my day-to-day -day work. Um, and then often I, I go to use an API and in Python, I, I, a lot of times I have to kind of access APIs in a more manual way because there aren't nicely built wrappers like in the R OpenSci uh, project. So I got really excited when um, at a, a recent conference, I saw um, a presentation about the establishment of this Pi OpenSci uh, project. Um, and I, uh, that's what this poster is about. So um, right now they're, as I said, it's, it's still uh, getting going. Um, there aren't a ton of uh, packages out there in the ecosystem yet, um, but they've what they've been spending a lot of time uh, doing so far is setting up the um, the mechanics for um, organizing the the peer review process, which is pretty important. So um, uh, that's what this uh, little workflow is about here. Um, it's all done through uh, GitHub, so it's all uh, completely open. Um, and the way it works is, uh, I can show you in this other tab here is if you, um, here is the Pi OpenSci software review uh, tab. It's all actually done through the issues. So if you go, um, there's no code except for a readme in this uh, GitHub repository. If you go into issues and click on a new issue, um, there are templates in there that um, let you, I guess, file different types of issues. You can type, um, file um, a help request to, to ask for help with something, um, a pre-submission inquiry to, to make sure that the package that you 
intend to build or have already built meets the, the scope of requirements before it goes through um, the, the peer review process or to actually submit a peer review uh, so piece of software for, for review. And then once you do that, it has kind of like a, a pre-built form in there asking a bunch of different questions. Um, so once you submit a package for peer review, um, uh, they uh, solicit editors uh, usually um, who are familiar with that, that specific um, field of science. Um, and then uh, it goes through a peer review process. Um, there are times, uh, uh, deadlines for each one of these uh, different processes. Um, what they're, the reviewers are, are judging the uh, package based on are uh, whether it fits into the, the Pi OpenSci um, uh, scope, I guess. Um, looking at uh, domain community scan standards. So for something like biodiversity, um, a biodiversity API endpoint to, to kind of make sure that uh, we're using a, a lot of the, the Tadwig standards, um, make sure that automated tests are involved, uh, documentation is, is up to snuff, um, the correct licenses are included, and um, that there is a way to, to archive it uh, through like Zenodo or something like that so that it doesn't just disappear off the face of the earth. Um, and then once it's accepted, um, you, it can be fast tracked into um, publication into the, the Journal of Open Source Software, uh, JOS. Um, you can also, um, if you happen to be, there are a lot of uh, great pieces of software out there that I, I come across often on, on GitHub that were probably written in the course of a project or, or um, a graduate degree and kind of people move on to other things and um, software gets abandoned, um, so to say. Um, the Pi OpenSci project gives it a, a place to like uh, be adopted and maintained um, after it's accepted. And you also get a, a cool badge on a, a README. So um, I wasn't keeping track of time at all, but um, I know I tend to talk a little fast when I'm excited about something. So um, hopefully that covered everything. Well, there's time for questions. Ideas, thoughts, feedback. I'm not really a, a Python programmer as such, but I'm happy to contribute. I've been contributing to our open sci for quite some time with packages like RGBIF and Spock. So happy to be part of the team and in the process, maybe learn a little bit of Python myself. That's great. Yeah, so one one of the um, uh, pieces that I didn't actually mention is that there is a great um, resources on here. So um, uh, there's a, a guidebook that talks a lot about the, the peer review process, but also like best practices for creating a, a Python packages. Um, in, in a modern way. So um, that's a great way to, um, to, to learn uh, Python. Um, and then also there are uh, uh, community calls are gonna be started in, in spring of 2022 is the, is the plan. Um, so that's another way to get involved uh, monthly community calls. Y'all jump in. All right, David. Uh, yeah, um, so that that's really interesting. I wasn't aware of this project. So thanks for sharing. Uh, uh, so, to what extent are you involved? Is it just something you found and wanted to share here, or are you part of the core group? Are you maintainer of uh, some of the packages? Uh, uh, what's your involvement? It's uh, yes to a few of those. Um, so I, I saw it at the um, uh, the SciPy conference that happened uh, this past summer. Uh, got excited about it, um, and uh, I would like to. Um, I have ideas for several different packages uh, to to create. Um, haven't actually done that yet. Um, and then there, I also volunteer to to review packages. Um, no um, biodiversity packages have come through, uh, like I said yet. So um, I'm like a standby reviewer, I, I suppose. Yeah, and that, this was the other question I was having. 
Um, have you noticed like any gaps where not necessarily you have the expertise, but where you know that there is expertise within the Tedwick community or something where we could connect the, the, yeah, uh, the actors uh, on, on the one side and then the, the demand for the package on the other side? That's, yeah, that's a great question. That, that is something that I have noticed. I don't know the, the best mechanism for that, like to say that like, there's this API endpoint that I use all the time. Um, there, it doesn't exist a, a Python package for it. I don't have the time to write it. Would someone in the group like to, or or even someone from the um, the community, um, or from the, the the same group who who wrote the um, API endpoint, or even maybe uh, wild ideas like matching up um, uh, people like interns or um, other um, temporary. Um, uh, workers to um, who may know Python and maybe the endpoint was written in Java and connect those those two. Okay, thanks. I have a question. Um, yeah. What do you see uh, for people that might be new to the OpenSci um, community? Uh, what do you see is really the major advantages for participating um, when you're developing? Python or R packages um, in OpenSci? Um, I, I think starting to recognize the, um, I guess the, the seal of approval is, is pretty big um, as somebody who's, who's new. Um, I know in, in the R community, once you see the, R, that something is part of the R OpenSci, you kind of recognize that it is the one that is uh, being used for um, a certain API endpoint. Um, there are, not to say that there aren't great Python packages out there for certain API endpoints. They are um, really great. Um, maybe something uh, that uh, another thing that could be uh, uh, a way to contribute would be to suggest packages to go through the peer review process because it's not for in new packages. It's um, there. I know like the the PyGBIF uh, package is is really great. Uses automated testing. Has great documentation. Um, and if they go through the peer review process, that would be a great um, example. So discoverability too, I think is huge for it. For the authors, um, it's also, you know, makes your uh, work more discoverable. Exactly, yep. Um, my turn, I'll make sure nobody else has a, um, I'm curious, if you could speak, and I know where I'm going with this, but you don't, Mike, um, <laughs> can you tie this quickly to your relationship with the Carpentries community and your work at the Smithsonian? Are, are there uh, synergistic motivations? Yes. Do you know where see. I'm kind of going with that? Possibly. Um, want me to be so, less cryptic? Uh, I'll be less cryptic if you want. So I, I think uh, training is, is also one of the things that's uh, mentioned with, we haven't gotten into training yet as part of the, the project, but uh, using examples as um, to, to train based on best practices for, for um, coding in Python in general um, uh -huh. could definitely fit in the Carpentries framework. Um, and then the Smithsonian does have um, an API that, that's the one that I intend to, to write the wrapper for it um, and put through the system. So the, and the historical reason why I brought, bring that up is for those of you, some of you will know this already, but if you look at the history of the Carpentries, uh, which was founded by Greg Wilson with Software Carpentry, his motivation for doing that was to look at, in, in particular, like the biology world, for example, self-taught programmers and things like uh, their learning to do it on, the, on their own. So perhaps the commenting's not quite the way it needs to be or the formatting. Um, so this notion of uh, the program was really built to sort of address self-taught people's skills and sort of bridge the gaps to what that, that might happen when you're self-taught. And then data carpentry was evolved much later as a way to, to um, welcome beginners, novices, people who like, I don't know what a variable is. So there, there were very different motivations for those two worlds. And here, what I also see is a relationship to the, that it's new for me, the new acronym CARE fair, fair data and care and that R and care and this notion of what constitutes not reproducible science, although it is, but uh, responsible data science and what does that mean? 
and as for example part of the review process that when you're publishing a paper or in this case code or something uh what should we be looking for so making that very explicit and providing a network where people can get help to achieve that would that be a good summary i couldn't have said it better myself thank you <laughs> <laughs> i i mean i thought it is cool to see this thinking about like i said the origins of software carpentry yeah. um, Nice to know there's a network around it. Other thoughts and comments before we final ideas? I'm going to stop sharing my screen before I do something embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> like me eating my soup before I got to turn off the camera, which is now recorded. <laughs> one of the. Go, Yorick. One of the uh, really enjoy about the R OpenSci, and hi, hi. Uh, the, one of the things I really enjoy about the R OpenSci, and probably also the uh, Pi uh, OpenSci idea, is that the reviews really help to share uh, share knowledge, just like was almost mentioned. And particularly for R OpenSci, there are some very cranky packet reviewers somewhere in Germany that really take a close look at uh, the quality of the packages. So uh, they actually are able to reuse that because these are not hired by our open site. These are dedicated, I think, our package uh, volunteers. So you know, uh, Matt was talking about the so your, can I ask, I mean, is that, I'm not sure where you were going with that exactly. I would want to ask if there's a code of conduct. I mean, you often see that the R community is touted as being extremely welcome, um, very kind. Oh, sorry, we have a lag. I didn't realize. I apologize, Jort. Oh, yes, there, there is a code of conduct. Um, hopefully that, that answers most of that. I'll, um, check, check with your in the chat, let him know, because I'm not sure I got the sense yeah, of this I'll, whole I'll question. In the, the other chat as well, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, this timing thing, it's been 30 minutes and we only got through two posters. Thanks, Wayland. <laughs> we better go a little faster. Abby? Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share. Um, this primer that we built. So I'm chair of a what's called a cluster in the Earth Science Information Partners. Um, we have a, a biological data standardization cluster. And we've been working on um, this primer. So this is an output of the cluster that we wanted to try to um, spread awareness about standards that exist for biological data. So that's what this is intended to do. Um, a lot of work that happens that, that I'm involved in is taking data that's sort of in its norm, native format and aligning it to Darwin Core. Um, so if we could kind of spread awareness about the standards that are out there, maybe um, data managers could be using them in their systems already. So that's kind of you know who this is targeted for, are data managers who are unaware of um, standards that exist. So. Um, so we try to provide um, a value proposition for why you might want to use standards for your data. And then on the left-hand side are questions we think a data manager might ask, um, such as, do you want to provide context and understandability to your data with a bit of a value proposition underneath that about why you might want to do that. And then on the right-hand side are, um, are standards that would, uh, would meet that need, meet that goal, and then example repositories that are accepting those standards. Um, we intended this to be a sort of a TLDR, you know, not trying to provide everyone all of the information, but just, um, just a little bit to kind of get people uh, interested and involved. And so in that way, we kept acronyms in there. So it's very acronym heavy, uh, but these, we did provide links. So these link out um, so that if, uh, people see something, they want to know more about it, they can click the link and find out more information. So that kind of continues that, um, 
that method of, of asking a question, providing the answer on the right-hand side continues down. Um, this one we wanted to include at the bottom, um, but doesn't have standards that go along with it, but just some um, things we thought might be helpful to take into account. And then um, underneath that, we say you can use any standards together um, in any way you want, uh, but that there you do have to watch out because there are uh, certain places where you need to use certain combinations of standards together. Um, and we don't mean this to be completely uh, fully comprehensive. Uh, so if people want all of the standards, uh, we provide this link to fairsharing.org, which does provide a very comprehensive list of standards that are available for biological data. Um, and then a link to the cluster if people want more information or wanna get involved. Um, and so that's basically it. Great timing, thank you. I don't know if there's any questions. Wait a minute, I have to bake. Oh, and actually, I have one other thing I wanted to say while I have you all is that um, the cluster, just because of uh, the way things happened, is very marine heavy. Um, so any input from terrestrial or freshwater communities on this would be great to have. And places where there isn't a link, but you is because we didn't know of an authoritative URL to put in there. So if you know of one, um, please let me know so I can put that, so we can get that added in. Thoughts, questions? I have a question. This is Gail. Um, where would you put Tadwig in this? I mean, I see Darwin Core, but it's linked to GBIF and other places, but I don't see Tadwig at all on your poster. Yeah, so we don't really talk much about the organizing bodies that oversee the standards. We really just are trying to get people linked up with the standards themselves. Um, so I think probably the same, it's the same for like climate and forecast or the other standards that may have organizing bodies over, over top of them. Yeah, we don't talk about them here, it's true. I, I have a uh, question I would ask you is, and I apologize, I'm trying to keep time and look at the notes. So if I missed it and you said it, we all have to be kind, thanks. So Abby, um, what about where you put these materials? Can the community contribute to them? You're talking about, for example, adding terrestrial information. Are they in a GitHub repository? Can they be forked and translated into a different language? Um, where are they? That's a really good suggestion. I'm gonna put a link in the chat that's to um, the ESIP figshare where this is published. Um, this is version one, so we do plan on making it like a living document where we would provide updates. I, we don't have a GitHub where you can say, hey, I wanna, I, I think you should make these updates. So that's, that's something we, that's a good suggestion that we should implement. And to Gail's point, I think, and I'm, I'm, this, I'm clearly biased here, um, I think the effort that goes into standards building them and the effort that goes into getting them used, um, I, I do think that people need to be aware that they're there. They don't have to be experts in them at all, but I think that the, uh, the more we hide it, the less people are aware and they can then pay it forward. When they start a new lab or start a new project or start collecting data, then they often go through the pain of, of having to um, figure out how to get it into a standard format. Oh. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think it's Katja's turn with any other, and y'all please continue, you know, your chats and et cetera. Katja, you? Yep, I'm here. And um, uh, I think at least Yorit's here, who's one of the co-authors on this poster too. And um, if there's anybody else uh, who is a co-author, please feel free to speak up. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I think. Does anyone see it or is it still loading? Yeah, 
You see it. Thank you. Oh, you see it. Great. Um, yeah. So uh, this poster is um, uh, just announcing a, a brand new uh, funded project. Um, and by brand new is I, I think we've only been funded for about a month now. Um, and it's uh, um, a project called Big B, um, which is an initiative to promote understanding about of bees, uh, global bees, uh, through image and trait digitization. And um, uh, most people understand perhaps now that bees are really important, that there are pollinators of food as well as wild plants, um, and that they may be uh, or, or are declining, um, but um, there's about 20,000 species of bee worldwide. So there's, there's quite a lot of kinds of bees. Um, and the project Big Bee um, is uh, tackling this issue of um, uh, understanding bee declines, bee biodiversity, bee evolution um, from an image and trait perspective. So as everyone knows um, in this conference, uh, um, there's a historic record of bees that it's found in natural history collections. Um, and uh, uh, we hope to unlock um, that historic record, not only through the digitization of bee specimens, um, but all through, also through 2 and 3D imaging of those specimens. So by digitization of label data and 2 and 3D imaging. Um, so the project, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more here. Uh, uh, there we go. Um, so the project um, was funded by the National Science Foundation, U.S. National Science Foundation, um, through the ADBC uh, program. Um, and um, we are a network of uh, 13 institutions um, in the U.S., um, many of them residing in California, where I am at UC Santa Barbara, um, and all, but also other larger um, museums in California. And this is largely because bees are very speciose. There's a lot of bees um, in music areas, uh, drier areas, including California. Um, but lots of other great um, collections along, including um, uh, Harvard, the University of New Hampshire. Um, we are partnering with um, the collections at ASU, but also the Symbiota Hub at ASU. Um, and University of Michigan, um, Colorado, and the University of Kansas. Um, so one of some of our deliverables that we hope to accomplish during this project, we plan to accomplish, is that we're going to have a, a start a symbiota portal specifically called the Bee Library for uh, bee image um, tra and trait digitization. Um, and uh, um, to do the digitization, we're taking images uh, from a number of different angles. Um, so that would be in the objectives. Um, and we're not focusing on all 20,000 ASU, Arizona State University. Thank you, Gail. Um, uh, uh, we're not focusing on all 20,000 or so bee species to start with, but we're starting with 5,500 um, of uh, the major pollinating species, or so the species that are known uh, to pollinate agricultural crops. Um, and here's some examples of some of the image types that we're uh, working on. Um, one is a dorsal view with uh, label information for transcription. Um, uh, exemplar or diagnostic views that potentially could be helpful in bee identification and um, uh, some very close up views uh, for research studies such as the male genitalia. Um, and if you look at our poster and if you're interested in bees and what our target attacks are, um, there's a list um, in the poster. Um, the full, full proposal can be found online if you're curious for more of the details. And let's see if I can zoom up here. Um, we have a few deliverables already, so some things that are interesting things that I think are underway, especially for this community. So we're working with Notes from Nature, um, uh, the um, community science uh, platform for that's helpful in digitization 
of uh, label data um, for many uh, museums and institutions. Um, but we're developing a new tool for measurement um, with in collaboration with Notes from Nature um, that allows us to be able to measure the distance between the wing pads, kind of shoulder pads on bees, um, which is a proxy for bee body size. So for all of the bee specimens that we are digitizing, we will get a body size or trait measurement uh, from that. Um, some of the images that go into making 3D images, um, let's see if this will play, maybe, um, have already begun. Um, we're using a system called the Macropod uh, 3D from Macroscopic Solutions uh, for creating the image stacks. Um, uh, each image stack, uh, so a 3D composite is composed of somewhere between 30 and to 60 uh, um, uh, images, and each of those images um, is uh, uh, multifocal stacked images uh, composed of about 60 different images. So um, we're, uh, the output of the, the project is really to make the image stacks available. We will be creating some 3D models and working with people to improve uh, 3D model uh, reconstruction. But really, thanks Deb, three minutes. The, really the idea is to make the images available. Um, and with this, uh, working closely with Jorik Poland for new ideas and thinking about how to share um, images, not only um, as individual images, but also as image data sets. Um, and Jorik, I don't know if you wanna pipe in here. Yeah, you guys have I'm in time for questions, but barely, so go for it. Uh, yeah, packaging uh, data sets is uh, uh, something that is, um, uh, I'm very interested in. Uh, packaging and citing data sets without uh, having to move the heavens and earth. So hopefully we can, uh, we can find a way to do it through this project and uh, learn from it. Yeah, so we have uh, the first data set, um, sort of a test preliminary data set um, available where you can link to that. Um, and the data set has a unique hash to uh, show the provenance of the data set. Um, it's shared through Zenodo and through um, the Internet Archive. Um, so in conclusion, um, we'd love to partner um, and be involved as much as possible. And I really want to know what questions would you ask um, or what would you be able to investigate using the Big B image data set? Um, evolution of pollen hairs, understanding bee parasites, uh, variation in tongue length, how do you count hairs on a body? Um, there's a lot of really interesting and exciting questions. Um, and with that, I acknowledge our funding sources from the National Science Foundation um, and thank you. Yes, one minute left for questions. I think you answered most of them though, but y'all can continue in the chat. I think there's somebody who's wanting to know where you're gonna store images. That's wild. Um, the images that. will be stored through the Symbiota uh, portal and then shared through GBIF, um, but then the image sets or um, uh, sets of images um, that uh, are related to each other will be shared through Internet Archive and Zenodo. Okay. And, and if Steve, I missed your I saw, question, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Kat. I saw um, uh, also Steve, uh, for Steve Baskoff, uh, controlled vocabularies is going to be an important part of this with Audubon Core so that people can find and search images. So um, we look forward to being more involved in that. Thanks for that. Y'all follow up with each other and in the in Whova and whatever, because I remember I'm juggling like three screens here. So thanks for that. Um, next up, I have Eric. Is it Sokol? Did I say it right? Yep. Yep, I'm here. Um, can you hear me okay? Fabulous, yes. Great, I will share my screen. And it's 10 minutes total, but I'll give you like a three minute warning. Oh, thanks. Let's see. Somehow Katya's screen is still being shared. Oh yeah, I'm so, choosing yeah, which of my screens. Yeah, ah, as there soon we go. as he requests shares, it'll, it'll take it over, yeah. 
All right. Do you see my poster or do you see a bunch of other stuff? Poster. It's great. All right. Great. Um, yeah, so this project is um, it started out as a workshop convened by the Environmental Data Initiative. So I, I guess I'll give a quick intro. So I'm Eric Sokol and I work with the National Ecological Observatory Network in the US. So we're basically an observatory, if you're not familiar with NEON, we're an NSF funded observatory um, meant to, and the intention is we'll collect all kinds of different data sets from instrument data to aerial observation data to biodiversity data, basically for 30 years. And so we're in like year two or three of full operations. And <clears throat> so I'm a community ecologist and I work as a quantitative ecologist with NEON. And this is describing a partnership with the Environmental Data Initiative um, who are NSF funded and they um, run the repository that among other things houses the US long-term ecological research data. <clears throat> and um, so here, this uh, project is stemming from a workshop that EDI convened back in, I think, 2017. Um, and it's focused around um, a use case of folks doing community ecology. And the reason that that workshop was convened is because at the time, the um, LTER was funding synthesis working groups. And um, over and over again, at least like probably five or six synthesis groups over a, a few year period that I was aware of, were doing the same sort of work um, as they um, searched for data and reformatted it for analyses. And they kept putting it in a similar intermediate um, data format. And so um, Margaret O'Brien and folks from the Environmental Data Initiative led this workshop where they came up with a relatively flexible data model that was good for, um, that was useful for this use case of people that wanted to do community ecology, essentially take you know, species counts or species biodiversity data um, with multiple observations in space and time, but also repeated measures uh, and then plug them into different analyses. And um, so I'll zoom into, so the use case is basically, let's see here. Um, it, generalized in the bottom left here. So, you know, folks are mining data from the LTER database, um, lots of different formats and may or may not conform to Darwin Core, often not. Um, <clears throat> and then munging it into some intermediate format that's consistent across data sets and then spitting out drive data products. Um, <clears throat> and so there were a few opportunities that we realized here. One was that MEON data, um, are easy to put into the data pattern that the work that the workshop eventually came up with. Um, and then also this intermediate data pattern that's relatively flexible is fairly easy, should fairly easily be um, able to be transformed into um, a Darwin event core. <clears throat> so um, a little bit of background is that um, EDI has been taking, they, they found a, um, as they've gone through um, different LTR data sets, they found like similar workflows that can be modular, modularized, um, can be used to convert different you know, input data sets into this L1 data set. So they've kind of been brute force converting data sets into this and now are developing some workflows that can be reused. Um, and then additionally for NEON, um, we essentially made a wrapper for different data sets based off of input from folks at the uh, 2019 NEON Science Summit um, for taking NEON data and converting them into this intermediate format. And so really it's meant to be um, <clears throat> a tool for the community um, where the use case is folks that wanna answer community ecology questions, like say, for example, pull data, well, search data from the LTER and from NEON pull some data sets and then do some analyses or visualizations using things like the vegan package for R. Um, <clears throat> and this is to kind of help folks along so that they don't have to recreate the same sorts of data munging workflows over and over again. Um, another um, thing I wanna point out is that, <clears throat> you know, hopefully this will be useful for um, 
kind of facilitating folks putting out their derived data sets in relatively standard formats um, and facilitating them using eventually using Darwin Core um, and um, you know facilitating standard use of EML and things like that. So we're we're still kind of working out what if there's a way to um, you know kind of nudge people into a standard direction for their derived data products. Um, but what the poster here is focusing on is um, so here's an overview of the data pattern, <clears throat> and then down here is where you can download the R package with tools to search data sets in this format. Um, so basically wrappers for both the Environmental Data Initiative API and wrappers for NEON's API. Um, and then some examples of kind of the syntax for how you would interact with data sets. So pretty simple, you can search for data sets, you can read in a data set into your R environment, and then you can um, do things like flatten the tables and plot or plug it into analyses. And we um, just put together some plotting functions to work with the objects that are returned from read data. Um, so really this is meant, these are tools meant to facilitate data exploration for folks that wanna access some um, NEON data sets um, and <clears throat> the uh, EDI data sets. And so, and I also want to acknowledge that this data visualization stuff, the different plotting packages, um, had a lot of input from an undergrad intern um, here, Savannah Gonzalez, and input from uh, various data users. And um, so, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions or talk more about the tools that we're developing here. Thanks. And we'll make it quick too. We also have another person who's asked me to share their video because they have bandwidth issues. And so I'll try to squeeze that in as well. Um, any questions for Eric? I'm sorry, I'll open the chat just to see if I'm missing anything. Oh, I see Margaret's put some links in there. Margaret, you have a comment to add? I think I'm using audio. Yeah, you are. Um, yep. I just wanted to add one more comment um, that with this workflow that you see in the lower left of this um, poster, we actually are able to, I think the right word would be liberate a lot <laughs> of the like data that comes from places like LTER for um, an aggregator like GBIF. Um, we have uh, right now in the already, already converted and ready uh, already converted all the way to Darwin Core Archives, about 70 data packages. And I they total somewhere in the hundreds of millions of records. I'm not exactly sure. I'll know in a couple of weeks when we actually get the scripts going to get them into GBIF. Um, but the, the conversion from the intermediate model to a Darwin Core Archive event core is pretty straightforward and almost not quite lossless, but close. The loss happens going from the original data sets, which are what I would call bespoke. They are highly customized for the um, particular sampling events that were going on at the time. That's occasionally there's metadata that, that's lost at that point, but not um, not from the intermediate model to a uh, Darwin Core Archive. There's a lot of similarities there. Thanks. Yeah. The goal is. To, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and one of the other, I guess one of the other. Um, things that makes this data pattern useful is that these ancillary tables allow a lot of flexibility to put in other data, um, you know, like all kinds of different things that um, map to different kind of granularities in the data set or, you know, other variables that don't necessarily fit into at least the Darwin uh, event core at the time when we started looking at this. Sure. Um, well, we certainly want to keep learning more about how we can help make that so that it fits and the data come out more as you were pointing out margaret come together for people and we do think that some of our patterns of organization will actually map to some of the darwin core extensions but how to actually work with those in the most efficient way um we're still trying to figure that part out okay. um, but to because us. it's just yeah okay but because this is a workflow it the text or the uh, code can be adapted for other styles of Darwin Core Archive in the future and data we contributed. So thank you very much. Thank you both of you.
Um, Dimitri, it's your turn. And y'all keep the conversation going there for how we can uh, help you out and help everybody on that topic. I think there's a slight lag, but I think it will work eventually. Dimitri, we are seeing the black screen, or at least I am on my end, it might be my lag, that says you've started screen sharing, but we don't see it yet. Yeah, this happened during a presentation he had. Uh, there's just a slight lag. Yep. Dimitri, I would um, stop sharing and try to share again. Yeah, worst case scenario too, I can share it for you, Dimitri, and then you could walk through it. Not ideal, but doable. I wonder if he isn't hearing us. I'm paying him on a or two. While we're waiting, um, if there are any uh, people who wanted to submit a wild idea, make sure you get in line with them. Um, so that we know that you'd like to also present. Avery, if I request sharing, will it stop his share? Or uh, it should. Time? Yes, it should. Right, let me try that. Let me try yeah. that. Okay, hang on. I'm trying to figure out which screen to share. All right. Now, are y'all seeing my screen or no? Uh, the tax on works character state. Yep. Yeah, we can see it. You are. All right, now he's going to ping me up here and get her <laughs> and say, what the heck happened? Because I'm su suspicious that since we're not hearing at all, maybe he dropped. Now you can see how many windows I have open. We'll see how this works. OK, so I can actually share it just fine. Um, should we go to the next person, come back then to Dimitri? If I he... might be able to answer questions. Debbie. OK. Well, I just other, didn't. I'm, I'm but, trying to. Oh, his easier. Zoom is frozen. Go to the My next Zoom person. Zoom frozen. Go to the next person. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. let's go to the. Let's try. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. I have to go back. Uh, Ricketts. What's your first name? I apologize. Is it? Hi, it's Kiara. Kiara. There we go. Thank you. Yes. Please take it away. Click, click share, and it'll sure. take it away from me. Um, I didn't exactly prepare a 10 minute presentation no, on this, just, but just chat, go for it. Yeah, I did make a video on it. It's a quick three minute video that breaks down my poster. Um, yeah. So I thought I could maybe play that for you and then we could get the discussion rolling Sounds and maybe get perfect. the involvement of the rest of the team. Go. Cool. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. You have to share sound. So you back it up. And do you know where that option is in Zoom? Um, I did choose an option that said share sound. I'm not sure why it's not. Kara, in your um, in your Zoom setting, when you go up where the mic is, you should choose. Um, it's typically same as system. Well, I'm I'm here via the the Woover. Do you perhaps want to maybe try share from your side? It's on the post. It's linked on the post plus. Yeah, 
Um, Avery, do you want to do it? Yeah, give me just a moment and I'll bring it up. Get it yeah, we can hear it already. Somebody's playing. Technology. <laughs> An integrated biodiversity data portal. Biodiversity Advisor, developed by Sandy, is a system that will provide integrated biodiversity information to a wide range of users. Biodiversity data, previously hosted in multiple different locations, has led to data mismanagement, duplication, outdated data, and delays in data requests. Here we have a representation of how we use different tools and the TOGAF approach to organize and transform this chaotic information into ordered and structured data. This platform has been developed by integrating SAMBI's existing authoring layers through a service-orientated architecture approach. Some of these layers include the Botanical Database of Southern Africa, the Zoological Database of Southern Africa, and the Biodiversity Geographic Information System. Users will be able to interact with the platform via the website and various mobile applications. Users will have access to biodiversity data, including plant and animal species distribution data, geospatial data, ecosystem level data, books and literature, metadata and images. These data are aggregated from multiple diverse data partners across South Africa. Users will be able to navigate to different views or interfaces from the home page, depending on their needs. Available views include ecosystem and species pages, which present a summary of different ecosystems and species. Biodiversity planning pages provide access to existing spatial biodiversity planning products. And biodiversity indicators view, which hosts biodiversity monitoring data and indicators that provide a way of measuring the condition of biodiversity and progress towards biodiversity targets. This image is just a fun way of highlighting some of the many integration challenges we have experienced over the course of development, some of which are a lack of skills necessary to properly manage and or derive value from data sets, data pipeline inefficiencies causing delays, limited collaboration between data partners and Sanby's line of business, too many disparate data sources and or silos, escalating data storage costs, and the low quality and or outdated data. Some of the outcomes and improvements that will occur with data integration are informed decisions and policy design. Users are able to discover and automatically match attributes across data sources. Improved extract transformation and load of data into authoring layers. Consolidation of disparate tools and data. Reduce data preparation work by curating collected data for modeling and analysis. In conclusion, we hope that Biodiversity Advisor will encourage more effective management of data within Sandy, but also encourage the sharing of data by the biodiversity community to provide integrated products and services, which are needed to address complex environmental issues. That's it from us. I hope this has been informative. Thanks, Kiara. Questions for Kiara? Comments? Insights? I'm just reading your abstract, Kiara, getting a sense when I'm trying to pay attention to the technical details. Brenda, I don't know if you want to add anything. Brenda is our information systems manager, so this is her baby, really. There is a question in the chat as well. Thank it says, you. Um, what technical framework 
that the integration layer is built in or upon? So, hi, good evening. Um, part of what we're doing is taking the various author layers. So give an example of an authoring layer is, for example, Specify or Bronze 8. And we're using that to be able to build with Elasticsearch an indexing system which allows us to then integrate all the data. I don't know if I answered that correctly, David. Ah, David is saying, yes, thumbs up. We have to go to the next presenter, but I would encourage everybody to um, interact with the poster and Kiara and Brenda um, in the poster plus, so you can continue the conversation. Dimitri, do you want to try again now, or um, shall I show another video uh, from Toby and Gabon, who has no bandwidth for doing such? I will try again. Okay, and then Avery, it's uh, can you pull up that for next uh, Toby's poster? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Sorry, guys, um, technology. Um, Matt Yoder present, presented today our uh, uh, product, Tax and Works, which is a platform uh, to, uh, for taxonomists and uh, by informatician who are working with different kinds of data. And uh, Tax and Works uh, basically design as a modular structure which have uh, different uh, different kinds of data and manipulating uh, different data and uh, the poster i presented uh, about uh, morphological matrices we have in taxon works and uh, you can see an example of the matrix uh, it's uh, uh, representing uh, rows of the data uh, and rows could be uh, either taxa in the database or um, uh, collection objects or specimens. Columns are represented by uh, uh, descriptors or characters, uh, and uh, each descriptor may have multiple different values. Uh, we have uh, multiple uh, options uh, for sharing data. We export data in uh, multiple formats. Uh, I don't know if you can read, but we export data into TNT, Nexus, uh, NexML. And uh, so the data could be used and extend our uh, external application, for example, for phylogenetic analysis. Uh, this is one of the interfaces. Uh, this is all different matrices, which are in my project, uh, 3i Vortec Narinka database. And uh, once you have uh, data in the matrices, I, we can uh, generate uh, interactive keys, for example, and uh, those interfaces was recently added to uh, uh, Tax and Works. Uh, uh, many people, I'm sure, are already familiar with interactive uh, keys, and uh, this has uh, uh, several boxes. Uh, first one uh, represent list of the descriptors uh, from the matrix. Uh, each descriptor may be annotated with uh, illustration. So you can select character state directly from illustration. You can select one or you can select multiple uh, and update. So the, some, uh, some tags uh, was uh, removed from the list of remaining tags and was uh, eliminated. Uh, you can see uh, Errors of what uh, what eliminated those taxa. You can see uh, specific descriptors what what didn't match to the criteria of search. Uh, there are a few other options. There is zero tolerance, uh, allowing to keep certain taxa on the left side uh, if uh, number of errors below a certain number. 
Uh, you can change identification level. So we now have species in the key, but I can, uh, if I wanna identify, say to the subgenus or genus, I can do this by selecting the rank. Um, I can change the order of the descriptors, uh, is the original order in the matrix or as it is now, uh, program always suggests you the best character for uh, the separating remaining text in the list. So characters on the top will try to split group more or less evenly, while the characters at the bottom uh, will have uh, uh, either separate none of the taxa or uh, keep all the taxa in the list. Um, I want to show a few more interfaces. Uh, image matrix interface. Uh, yeah, this well will probably take a while to open. But basically, we I have a few illustrations on the posters. Uh, image matrix interface uh, basically uh, uh, show you uh, illustrations, standard view illustrations. Uh, uh, as a standard view for each taxon, and they will be presented in the table view uh, so that you can compare taxa one to another. Um, what else? Uh, I can probably try to show edit interface. Edit interface uh, give me uh, ability to select what taxa go to this particular matrix and what descriptors uh, go to this matrix. Uh, uh, so each, uh, I can go to the uh, uh, scoring interface and uh, it's it's quite nicely organized. So I have list of all the taxa and I can just select or deselect character states and uh, the program automatically makes all the changes. Uh, uh, the program also have ability to generate uh, natural language uh, description. So if uh, you I set up uh, some rules, also the character matrix could be uh, used to generate a description, which could be directly used uh, in preparation of the uh, monograph on this uh, group. And also can suggest you a diagnosis or a shortest list of the descriptors which separates this particular taxon from all other tags uh, in the matrix. And uh, we have uh, some thanks to the endowment which you have in our group. Uh, and of course, uh, some work was done using the NSF uh, uh, grant support. And with that, I would finish my presentation and would welcome any questions. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Dimitri. We've got a couple minutes. For questions. Anybody here also use matrices, build matrices? Well, I can uh, give a recommendation that is uh, while generating diagnosis to include an anchoring element into the diagnosis. So if the diagnosis is for a species, then start the diagnosis with the genus name and say that, I don't know, uh, Vespa with all these characters. Yeah, because uh, diagnosis should include an anchoring element to a classification if possible within the diagnosis itself. Well, in this case, it may be a not a true diagnosis of the species, uh, but basically it takes into account all the taxa included into the matrix and uh, try to find the shortest way to distinguish this particular entity from all entities in the matrix. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, if you were doing, uh, doing a revision of the group, it may not exactly satisfy your needs, but it also have uh, another purpose. Uh, in the matrix, it will show you if this species uh, 
if it's possible uh, to distinguish the species from other species in given matrix, do you have enough characters uh, to separate it from all other entities? Thanks. Thank you for that, Dimitri, and thank you for jumping into the conversation. And we're ready for a video. This is Toby joining us from Gabon, and he doesn't have the bandwidth to do this himself. Ali, Toby, uh, bienvenue, welcome. Um, we can't wait to hear your video, and Avery's going to share it. Thank you. My name is Toby. I am the assistant director at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute in Gabon. I am excited for the opportunity to present about the efforts on the way in Gabon to digitize and mobilize our vertebrate collection with the support of a GDF and BID grant. Gabon is a small country in Western equatorial Africa. And what we lack in size, we make up for in being incredibly united. Language is a major barrier for researchers waiting for digitize, wanting to digitize and publish collections data in Africa. Despite being the fifth most spoken language on earth and the second most common in Africa, French resources about digitization data management and publishing are lacking. Furthermore, French speaking, French speaking region of Africa, primarily three Central, West Africa, and Madagascar, was some of the highest biodiversity on the continent and therefore are of great importance to scientists and decision makers. Without having representation in online portal by GDF and IDIC Bio, these important collections are effectively invisible. Producing relevant or applicable resources about digitization in French will help shine a light on these valuable natural history records and allow the data holders in Africa to retain the autonomy of their collection. Awarded a GBF BEID grant in 2021, an international multi language network of partners has undertaken the important task of digitizing and mobilizing Gabon's vertebrates collection. There are an estimated 13,500 vertebrate specimens housed in five institutions in different parts of Gabon. To date, the group has mobilized for more than 4,600 vertebrates records to our recently launched Gabon Biodiversity Portal. The Gabon Portal also hosts French guides for using symbiota-based portals to manage georeference and publish natural history databases. This resource can provide much needed guidance for other francophone countries in Africa and beyond, working to maximize the accessibility and value of their biodiversity collections. Thank you very much for listening. Je m'appelle Eli Toby. Je suis conservateur adjoint au Smithsonian and Conservation Biology Institute au Gabon. Je suis ravi d'avoir l'opportunité de présenter les efforts en cours au Gabon pour numériser et mobiliser nos collections de vertébrés avec le soutien d'une subvention GBF BID. Le Gabon est un petit pays d'Afrique centrale et ce qui nous manque en taille, nous le compensons par une incroyable diversité biologique. La langue est un obstacle majeur pour les chercheurs qui veulent numériser et publier les données de collection en Afrique. Bien qu'il s'agisse de la cinquième langue la plus parlée au monde et de la deuxième en Afrique, les ressources en français sur la numérisation, la gestion des données et la publication font défaut. De plus, les régions francophones d'Afrique, 
principalement l'Afrique centrale, occidentale et Madagascar, abritent une partie de la plus grande biodiversité du continent et sont donc d'une grande importance pour les scientifiques et les décideurs. Sans représentation sur des portails numériques et des agrégateurs internationaux comme DBF et IDBio, ces importantes collections sont invisibles. La production de ressources pertinentes applicables sur la numérisation en français contribuera à mettre en lumière ces précieux documents d'histoire naturelle et permettra aux détenteurs de donner en Afrique de conserver l'autonomie de leur collection. Ayant obtenu une subvention de GBF BID en 2021, un réseau international et multilingue de partenaires a entrepris la tâche importante de numériser et de mobiliser des collections de vertébrés au Gabon. On estime à 13 500 le nombre de spécimens de vertébrés conservés dans cinq institutions situées dans différentes régions du Gabon. À ce jour, le groupe a mobilisé plus de 4 600 enregistrements de vertébrés sur le portail de la biodiversité gabonaise récemment lancé. Le portail contient également des guides en français sur l'utilisation des portails basés sur Symbiota pour gérer, géoréférencer et publier les bases de données de l'histoire naturelle. Ces ressources peuvent fournir des conseils indispensables à d'autres pays francophones en Afrique et ailleurs, qui cherchent à maximiser l'accessibilité et la valeur de leur collection de biodiversité. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Très bien. Merci. Oh, I think there are plenty of francophones and, and uh, francophiles in the room, so plenty of people who also speak French uh, who appreciate that. Um, thoughts or comments from people to share with Ali, Toby? I see people clapping. And please beg pardon if I don't say your name properly. Merci, Toby. Um, I'm a partner on this project, and if people want to see, I can give a brief tour of the newly launched portal if, if I can share my screen. It's fine with me. We have like four minutes, I think. And somebody correct me. I think we have four minutes till the session formally ends. Uh, formally, right? formally, yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, but well, you. I mean, you have time to keep going. So. Well, being, I want to be. I want to just always. I want to be respectful of people's time and yes. understand that this is being recorded. So if you do need to leave, you can come back. You won't miss out if you leave. So don't feel that pressure. Um, and if you can stay and you'd like to, um, we can quickly tour the other posters if you want. Uh, I think Margaret, you were asking for that. Please, please go ahead and share so we can. Is that, so is that yes, I, I, I can share the yes, my Greg. screen. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, please, please do. So I'll just Greg. give a, a very brief yeah. um, show of the portal. It's available in, can people see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, it's available in multiple languages. Um, French and English. And so this is a symbiota portal. And so um, Toby, myself, and, and many other partners in Gabon actively manage um, their collections through the portal. Um, but we also have screenshots or, or windows into other museum collections um, on the portal. So I'll just give a quick example. So you can search any number of species. You can limit it. There's, we're adding tons of images um, of specimens as well as live photos of animals um, taken in the field before they're preserved. Um, another great feature is the mapping feature. So there's just a lot of cool ways to explore. Um, Gabon's rich biodiversity. And I won't take up too much time showing this stuff off. Um, but, you know, you can pull up examples, um, details about each specimen that's mapped. But briefly, I'll just also show um, that we've translated all of these guides for managing data 
uh, managing collections and um, mobilizing data online through Symbiota and, and mobilizing it to GBIF. So there's a lot of resources in French for other Francophone um, projects to hopefully benefit from. And that's all freely available online through the portal. Um, and I dropped the link to the portal in the chat. So feel free to go and explore on your own. Thank you. If, Merci. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Um, thank you for the quick tour. And uh, Avery and others check the schedule for me. Thank you. Because again, I have several screens open. We have 30 more minutes. So we have time for conversations now, which is lovely. Um, other pe any people have questions for uh, Eli, Toby, for Toby or for Gregory? Comments? Ideas? Is it baking? I have one. I'll start then. Um, from the idea to do this, to get the data and to uh, using the GBIF uh, bid funds to set this up, how, how long did it take to get the portal up and running so people could start putting data in it? Um, I'll answer that. Um, it, it went relatively quickly, and that was thanks to the help and tremendous support from um, Ed Gilbert at ASU. He really, he's a partner on the project, and so it was up and running pretty quickly. It was also possible to really quickly mobilize the first, you know, 4,600 specimens because um, Toby, as a curator, has done a tremendous job of um, already digitizing the collections there into Excel documents. And so mm -hmm. we were able to upload things um, pretty quickly. The things that will take more time, of course, is georeferencing and, and uh, linking the photos to specimens is, is more time consuming. And then there's other collections within Gabon. There's actually five separate collections that we're working to digitize and mobilize. And some of them are in the state of still being in field notes. Um, so that will take a bit more time. but. Um, Next month, we'll be leading a, a workshop in Gabon to help sort of um, make a bigger push for getting those sort of earlier stage data um, up and online. So um, it went quickly in short um, because it was all the pieces were in place to, to move the first bit of data very quickly. The, the later half will take a bit longer. Thanks, merci. Yeah. So, so Gregory, would Ellie like, is he, I don't know, the, the bandwidth, would Toby like to speak? He can share in French if he's, other people here could translate, I suspect. Yeah, and Toby's to um, fluent in French and English. Oh, well, I can so. tell that from the video, but I just want yes. him to be comfortable with whatever. <laughs> right, of course. Wish. Toby, do you have anything to share? No, just to say thanks to everybody for uh, listening. And thank you, Greg for assisting me for the, with the IT. <laughs> of course. It was a pleasure. So um, can we have a spoiler alert? What's coming after the vertebrates? Collection, Gregory. Toby, do you want to answer that? Um, oh, yes. There's, a, there's a, a tremendous collection of inverts in Gabon. Eli, how many, or Toby, how many Inverts, do you have? Yeah, we ha we have one hundred uh, one thousand two hundred and oh seventy a mil, one hundred two hundred and one thousand. So, yeah, one hundred twenty-four thousand. No, twenty-one for atropod for invertebrates. It's over a hundred thousand. So, right? yeah, one hundred and twenty thousand more. Mm -hmm. So it will be great, as I saw the last poster presentation before this one, with uh, the, the bees. That will be great to have such a technology to digitize the arthropod collection here in Gabon. We really lack that, uh, and I would like to know more. This will be really great opportunity. And uh, if anyone, knows about uh, some opportunities of funding to have material and the technologies to digitize 
all this collection, it will be great. And the, the collection is still growing, you know, because uh, it is uh, like a snowball. The time is passing and the collection is growing. So I will really appreciate any opportunity to digitize that collection. Gotcha. I know you want to. Um, I just wanted to say, as one of the um, in, uh, PIs for the Big B project, we should get in touch and talk about uh, opportunities, potential opportunities. Yes, I was thinking, Mac, wouldn't Macropods want to be part of helping Gabon? Yeah, something like that. You know, um, I think we can at least uh, promote the idea and advertise it. Our our funding, the ADBC program, is only for U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but we can uh, definitely um, try and find other sources. And equipment or other sharing meaning. and yeah, something. Yeah, like equipment sharing potentially, or I don't know exactly, you know, I'd, I'd actually have to ask around, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at least for the bees. Um, uh, but um, I completely agree. It would be amazing to have uh, the digitization of all of the arthropod specimens of the collection in Gabon. I actually, I think I yeah. put a note on your poster plus that said the, oh. the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, also, I, I really believe that if we can uh, complete a project like that, it will be a great opportunity for a lot of research on bees because we have them in the collection but uh, we, we have been just working uh, to know the disturbance, the level of disturbance of uh, oil industry on the biodiversity. So uh, we didn't study the insect themselves for uh, uh, maybe parasite or thing like that. So I really believe that there are a lot of opportunities of uh, researches uh, around the collection. Yeah, I agree. It's really exciting. So we have uh, more time in this session, but you are free, of course, as many of you are probably doing, to go and peruse the other posters. Um, thoughts on the other presenters or any last minute takers for a, like a two minute version? <laughs> I don't know who joined us late, for example. It would also be great to get y'all's input after the fact of, you know, like things like the format, enjoying the being able to see the posters for the entire week, uh, being able to interact with the authors. Um, how do the authors find it? The fact that they can go in and read your comments and they get pinged. Um, for me personally, it makes the posters more, I'm not trying to squeeze them in in a physical meeting for that like one hour session and then it disappears off the wall. I, uh, uh, this is George speaking. I uh, uh, very much enjoyed the, um, the session organized by Arctic Bio where they had Kumo space, where you could sort of uh, walk around in a virtual space and look at the posters. I, I thought that was a very way to meet, casually meet people and have sort of hallway conversations. And uh, I was wondering whether you considered doing that also. Um, that, that particular platform, we were trying to keep it other than the couple of sessions inside the platform. And yeah, we did not. You can do a sort of instant meet inside Whova. I don't know how many of you've tried it. Katja and I did it the other day. You can set up a use private meeting option in the virtual meetups thing and you can chat with people. Not the same as what you're talking about, Yori. Ah. <laughs> Try to see what other posters we had that we didn't talk here.
I guess I have another one for Toby and Gregory then. What about the taxonomic information that you needed? What sources did you use to get your Symbiota instance going? Is there still here? Um, yeah. I could answer that. Yes, hey, Ed. thanks, Ed. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Deb. It's good to see you. It's been a while. Good to see you, too. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> it depends on the taxonomic group, but the Symbiota portal has tools in there where you could import um, taxonomy from Catalog of Life, uh, Worms database. And also, um, and Tropicos uh, using their API infrastructure. Uh -huh. um, and it does it based on per collection. So it goes through the collection and it checks the, um, it looks at the names that are not indexed in the internal taxonomic thesaurus. And then it checks the these different APIs. And then it'll add the name if it's not there, along with the, um, the taxonomy, the hierarchy, and and links, synonyms, and so forth. Um, and so basically, if, if you're doing stuff like the vertebrates, uh, we might use Catalog of Life, but, um, but if you're importing the invertebrates, then worms, um, marine invertebrates, worms are better. So it's a mixture of both. Thanks for that, Ed. I noticed there's, again, there's a lot of posters in here, but uh, the one that Papi and Savolo did is authoritative taxonomic databases for progress in edible insect and host plant inventories. And I wished that they were here so we could ask them more about that and uh, things like the relationships there, the insect host plant data and where they're getting their information from, et cetera. So. I plan you can always put in a comment. Huh? Yes, exactly, <laughs> Peter. That's what I was going to say. I have to go in there and actually, I was hoping to be here so I could actually ask that question with all these lovely people in the room who have overlapping interests, right, in all these, these related topics. But I will put it in there. Thank you. Yes. Hi, it's Wayne. I just have a general question, comment. Go for it. Because I, the NEON presentation reminded me, I actually went to a NEON conference once. And what they said was they wanted to understand the whole ecosystem from like the treetops to bedrock. And for that means that you need inter really interdisciplinary science. It's not just one type of biologist talking to another biologist. You need biologists talking to hydrologists, talking to remote, remote sensing people, yep. talking to geologists. And here, you know, the, the word, you know, information silo has ha happened multiple times, but mm -hmm. still you're just the biodiversity. You're still just like talking about biology, but to understand, you know, the ecosystem, you need to expand into these other topics to, to really understand how everything connects together. And I think one of the best example, because I, I, I remember someone mentioned astrobiology yesterday. Uh -huh. That whole field, that is the most interdisciplinary science that I've seen, where you go to a conference and you can have a physicist, a chemist, an astronomer, a biologist, even philosophers, and they're uh -huh. all talking to each other uh -huh. because they're trying to understand this basic, the most basic question is, is life an accident or is it an inevitability? Uh -huh. And that they're trying to, it's a, basically a biology question, but you have all these fields from that are talking to each other, trying to understand that question. And they're trying to answer the question about the origin of life. Mm -hmm. In conservation, we're trying to preserve life on earth. And I think in that sense, we do need that deep type of interdisciplinary talk that goes beyond just this biologist talking to biologists. Oh. Other thoughts or comments on that? Because I will, but I want to hear y'all's oh. thoughts. I'll chime in a little. Um, I think that's a really good perspective. <clears throat> and I'll just say, 
from experience, like working at Neon, um, you know, the data products that we mapped to the uh, <clears throat> to the Ecocom DP format is like 12 out of 181 data products where, you know, we have a lot of instrument data and surface atmosphere exchange data and um, in LIDAR data coming off of um, the sensor on the airplane. And so um, in terms of what NEON does, like this is just a really tiny part. And then um, I guess just to add some perspective to that too, like, you know, there's the NCAR NEON collaboration going on where they're running uh, the community land models at different, um, yeah, NCAR is the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And um, so they're running, you know, the community land models to understand atmosphere exchange things at NEON sites and like all the bio biodiversity data is just kind of like a parameter they put in their model to understand, you know, earth systems. So like, it's a really kind of shift in perspective because like I think of as a community ecologist, the stuff they do is like the predictor variables and drivers of what happens with biodiversity and they kind of flip that on it on their on its head. And it's just a, one of many like hundreds of inputs into their crazy model. So. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the different ways to to kind of view these things. Other ideas? I would add from my experience, uh, Weilin, Weilin, sorry, and I now I want to go to an astrobiology meeting. I have to say, you have now put that on my to do wish list. Um, I in the past, let's say 12 years, the I can say the only meeting in this community peripherally that I've been to that gets even a touch toward what you were saying was the people who do island biogeography. Um, they meet roughly every other year. They meet in those far-flung places that are island biogeographic in nature, uh, Reunion Island, Madagascar, the Azores, etc. Um, they have always the social science track at their meetings. And it, it's again, speak to the nature of the research and the conservation efforts that they do. If you have an island that's being decimated by some introduced species and you need to get rid of it, but that species also feeds the people in that environment. It also produces uh, products for them to sell. Um, it's a very difficult conversation to have about the what you're going to need to do to remove that species and deal with the economic impacts. Uh, so they need social scientists in their world or they can't do the work that they do. Um, so it again, what questions are we trying to answer? Are the people at the table we need or the kind of conversations we were having yesterday about that? Where does the digital specimen fit in the realm of all this other data that you're thinking about that we're talking about or not talking about? Um, I don't know, other people here must have thoughts on this topic. Interdisciplinary needs. I'm always open for going to exotic islands. Mm. So cool. at least that part sounds really attractive to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think integrating a social track in uh, conferences like that one, and even like this one is, is extremely valuable. Thank you for that feedback, Peter. We were asked, I, I did, many of you may have noticed between that panel discussion on Tuesday and the session on Monday, um, you could hear some of that uh, now, which is, I, I also am appreciating. Arthur, are you trying to say something? Thank you. Yes, Deb. Um, when I was involved with the, uh, the funding system in Sao Paulo in Brazil, at one stage, all the projects had to have a social science aspect to the projects. Uh, and this was, was very interesting looking at, uh, they'd bring social scientists into each project, for example, looking at clearing of the Amazon. We had a social scientist looking at the effects of that clearing. And <clears throat> Also, uh, in, in one project, there was um, work on looking at um, the um, destruction of some of the, the, the palm oil trees and some of the, the monkeys on the islands. And the social scientist studies found that 
a lot of it to do with fishermen in weather where they couldn't go out were having to, to supplement their income by uh, doing something else. So they started harvesting the palm, palm oil from the palm trees and to catching monkeys, etc., like that. So it led to changes in the way some of the conservation practices were being carried out. So if every project had to have a social science aspect. I'm not sure whether that's continuing now or not. At one stage, it got a little bit the other way. There was too much social science and not enough uh, biological science in some of the projects, but uh, it, it was an interesting exercise. I, I think Wei Yin's example and yours, uh, I mean, they speak to this, you know, what are the questions we're trying to address from the, whether it's local to global, right? So they are going to vary, but you know, when we talk about integrating data, what data is it we're talking about that will be integrated? So when Wai Yin gave her example, I started thinking about NASA data. And I've been trying to figure out a way to get us all tied into like the NASA Space Apps Challenge. Some of you may know of it, um, that they have once a year. I think our community could be do amazing stuff integrating um, the kind of data that we have with the kind of data that NASA puts together. Um, and there were initiatives and even NSF related funded projects to do such a thing, but we're talking 20, we're talking more than 10 years ago now, or maybe 20. Um, but I think the time has come to try again. And to that idea, I'm a software developer. Uh -huh. I've, been to, I've been to meetings where it was a software developer and people from NASA would come to our meetings and tell us about the data that they use because NASA you know, they have a, a much more public focus than some of the other science institutions or organizations or disciplines, mm -hmm. um, part of kind of their charter or whatever, you know, pu public use. Yep. And, and the meetings were packed. You have all these like software people getting really excited. And I've never seen like any biology try to do that, so. I want other people to speak up. I can give one more example, but y'all have to share your example. So weigh in, I, I can give you one tiny example. Um, I was at Ohio State University. And again, people have time in their realms that's constructed around what they need to get done, right? So the time they have to build networks is, is structured and, and directed. I, on the other hand, was going to present there to the ecology and uh, evolution department. And I had the chance to ask the people, hey, have you talked with your uh, computer science people, like the people who do data visualizations, for example, about kind of work that we do? And they were like, essentially, they, you know, hadn't had time or tried once a long time ago. Well, I went knocking on the door uh, because I talked to a friend from Argonne National Labs, and I don't know these people at Ohio State in the computer science department. So I said, who do you know at Ohio State I could talk to? And they introduced me to a computer scientist there at Ohio State who teaches computer data, who teaches data visualization. And he is looking for data sets for his students that are novel. So wrapping their brains around the kind of data that they've never seen before and asking them to do stuff with it. Um, he was thrilled. He'd never seen our data sets. He didn't know we existed. He didn't know this data existed. Um, so to your point. On the other extreme is the uh, is the use of citizen science. Even BioBlitz is a social science exercise, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the the use of citizen science in in a lot of these projects can can be very valuable. And there's quite a few happening in Australia at the moment, following the bushfires, and using citizen sciences to collect data on uh, bushfire recovery and uh, quite a few other. Um, interesting aspects, collecting wombat dung to look at whether wombats changed their um, diet following fires and found that wombats started eating insects instead of just plants and things like that. And a lot of that came out of citizen science activities on the social science side. Um, just to that, I was actually in a crowdsourcing workshop um, earlier this week about um, citizen science and also digital humanities and saying how I mean, one of the things that was being recommended 
was that the two disciplines should talk to each other and should collaborate more rather than be siloed. So it's, it's interesting seeing exactly the same sorts of discussions at the second workshop slash conference I've attended this week. It's, um, yeah, it's quite um, pleasing to me because I agree with practically everything that's been said here. And one more comment, I actually, I remember one time I went to a talk and this was a, 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 a firm that did surveys of public perception of science. And they found, discovered through that survey was that people like the general public have a very different conception of science than the people who are, than scientists. So there, so there, that's why there's the communication issues that if scientists talk to as scientists to the public, it just doesn't work. So you have to keep that in mind of as you if you just, as you're trying to reach out, either through citizen science or through the humanities, that you you can't you have to use a new skill set, new communication tools to make that happen. Weigh in if I could do plus 1000, I would in the happy dance and some of the people here who know me well have heard me say. Um, I think we hit on a close point of that in the last session when we were talking about uh, taxonomic names and management of them. This perception that Teresa was sharing, for example, that a, a list of valid and accepted names gives the non scientist outside people looking at those lists the perception that science is done and tidy. Right, it's all decided and complete and understood, and uh, the the gaps don't show. They can't see the gaps, so they don't know the gaps are there. They don't know that scientists are working on trying to fill those um, any more than they understand that there are differing opinions. Uh, and and again, to be fair, those lists are great because they allow us to search giant databases that have been munged together from many different places and and collection managers need to know where their stuff is in their collection. So we have all these overlapping circles of need and it's looking for where that sweet spot is that you know this system or suite of systems or tools meets yours and my overlap in need right and i tried to point out that kating and kingston paper maybe somebody can quickly put the whole citation in there i talked about that yesterday that's a really nice concrete example um, of this concept you're bringing up and why it's important and there was another one Back at 2013 in Tadwig, we had a social scientist come and talk to us. His name is Eric Meyer. He was at the Oxford Institute. Now I think he's at the University of somewhere in Texas. I don't want to get it wrong. Um, he studies how scientists do their work. And one of the things he said was what we're doing right here is scientists need to shed light on the things that don't go well and shed light on the processes, sort of how we do the, do what we do. And um, that's another humanities case that was brought up the other day that Martha Fleming from the UK, she brought it up and shared that uh, those are the only ways in which we address things like injustice in the way the research is carried out or uh, exclusion or something, something like that. And you, unless you talk about it and bring it to light, it, it stays hidden. So for all of these cool things that you're bringing up. We only have a few minutes. Final thoughts people want to share? If we're going to be silent, I might as well thank everybody for looking at all the posters. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had uh, over over 80 people look at me while I was presenting a poster. That was a new one for me. Thanks, Peter. And yes, <laughs> certainly thanks to everyone. And, and I think, yeah, I see some people clapping their hands. Yay, we can use the emojis that Zoom gives us. Um, thanks to everybody for uh, being going on this adventure inside Posters Plus with us for all for the first time and for contributing to the conversation and for contributing content to give us something to talk about and think about. Um, and if you weren't at my talk the other day, I would use the iceberg example again. The tip of the iceberg is the data and the facts. Underneath the water uh, is the expertise and experiences that y'all have been sharing here. 
that the only way to do it is to connect people together. And um, that's the tacit knowledge. And that's most of the information. And, and we need that. So thank you for sharing. See you at the next session. Yes, a big hand, big round of applause, everybody. Thank you very much. Yay. Avery, I think you can stop the recording. <laughs> We're stopping it right now. Thanks, Deb.